Welcome to AM Prime on WESN Content Capital. I'm Keaton Shaw. Thank you very much for joining us this morning for this edition of the program. Well, I'm not so sure if you're aware, uh, but this is the last year, 2024 is the last year of the international decade for people of African descent. From 2015 to 2024, it was declared uh, by the United Nations General Assembly in a resolution of the theme for this particular decade is people of African descent, recognition, justice, and development. Now, when we speak about justice, uh, within recent times, it's, it's a conversation that's been going on for years, but over the last three to five years in particular, uh, it, it seems to have geared up a bit further. The conversation of repatriations, uh, in fact, uh, the Ministry of Foreign and CARICOM Affairs uh, on the 3rd of October 2023 uh, announced the appointment of the Trinidad and Tobago's reconstituted National Committee on Reparations. Uh, Senator the Honourable Dr. Emery Brown, the Minister of Foreign and CARICOM Affairs, uh, wished to announce the appointment of the Cabinet uh, by cabinet, sorry, of the reconstituted National Committee on Reparations in keeping with CARICOM's decision uh, to treat CARICOM member states in the establishment of national committees on reparations whose respective chairs sit on the CARICOM Regional Commission on Reparations. So the CARICOM Regional uh, Commission on Reparations actually has already uh, presented a 10-point plan. Uh, we're not going to get into that right now, uh, but uh, earlier this week on Monday, the uh, reconstituted National Committee on Reparations uh, said it will not stop until justice is served for crimes committed against those enslaved. Now, this word justice in particular has been very vague. It's oftentimes been spoken about as just being solely financial. In fact, when we speak about reparations as well, it focuses solely on the British. Again, that's something we'll get into a bit later on, but uh, speaking at uh, a conference held in Napa uh, on Monday, the committee announced that it had devised an action plan which includes everything from receiving a formal apology, debt cancellation, as well as the elimination of public monuments and signage that celebrate those who, it said, benefited from colonial crimes. Now, the Minister of uh, Foreign and Caricom Affairs, Dr. Amy Brown, uh, gave the feature address uh, during that conference held on Monday at Napa, and he emphasized the need for reparations while delivering the feature address uh, he's also uh, pushing very much for justice. Again, we'll speak about justice a bit later on. But let's hear first what the Minister of Foreign and CARICOM Affairs had to say during his feature address on Monday. As Minister of Foreign and CARICOM Affairs, I have supported and contributed to our Caribbean community's deployment of advocacy and diplomacy as many have collectively advanced the global reach of the reparations agenda, and I fully appreciate the need for sustained coordination in this regard. At the level of CARICOM, we have deliberated and agreed on a broad strategy aimed at informing a wide range of initiatives to advance the reparations movement. This strategy involves working assiduously to expand the network of allies and to constrict the circles of those who are opposed to reparations. To constrict the circle of those who are opposed to reparations. And if you think there are not those who are opposed to reparations, then you need to think again. The crimes against humanity of native genocide, the transatlantic trafficking of enslaved Africans and a radicalized system of chattel slavery demand historical justice. As a consequence of strategic efforts to achieve this, I can say that our community, the Caribbean community, is widely regarded as an important nucleus of the reparations movement with chain reactions triggered across the globe. We recognize that the strategic advocacy process with an underlying international, regional, and national component is essential in order to secure reparations from the governments 
of all the former colonial powers and from related institutions of those countries to the nations and people of the Caribbean community that were severely affected, that are severely affected. To that end, specific diplomatic proposals continue to be formulated, instituted, and implemented at various levels. Now, the minister spoke about specific diplomatic relations. Uh, and, and the thing is, bearing in mind uh, that as part of this entire conversation of national efforts, uh, that the prime minister actually wrote uh, to Prince William uh, in respect uh, to the fight for reparations. Now, I don't know if you recall that uh, approximately 10 years ago, 8 to 10 years ago, the former prime minister uh, of uh, the United Kingdom, that is uh, David Cameron, uh, upon his visit to Jamaica, when the conversation of reparations came up, he, he basically said, move on. Now, Prime Minister Dr. Keith Rowley has led this conversation within CARICOM. In fact, he's also been joined by his colleagues in Mia Motley, Prime Minister of Barbados, as well as the Prime Minister of St. Vincent and the Grenadines, Dr. Ralph Gonzalez. But he wrote uh, to the monarch in England and, uh, well, he said he never got a response. Now, moving on to get a better understanding of exactly what is taking place and where we are at, why is it now that reparations seem to be more realistic as compared to pre-independence or post-independence fights from former colonial states? Well, Sir Hilary Beckles, who is one of the world's foremost experts in the transatlantic slave trade, he also serves as the vice chancellor of the University of the West Indies and chairman of the CARICOM Reparations Commission, he sat down uh, with the United Nations to discuss the importance of reparations for the transatlantic trade state. Now, bearing in mind, he has made quite a stellar argument for reparations, seeing that Eric Williams, former Prime Minister of TNT, who we refer to as the father of the nation, in his book, his thesis, Capitalism and Slavery, called for reparations. He's added to that argument. But let's hear what Sir Hilary Beckles had to say during his discussions with the United Nations. There is no institution in modernity that has changed the world as profoundly as the transatlantic slave trade and slavery in general. And then we see the evidence of those legacies everywhere, not only in the places where it was practiced, like in the entire Americas, uh, the impact on Africa. Most societies where it has touched are now structured in such a way that people of African descent are considered the most marginalized people in those societies. The descendants of these enslaved people, they still continue to suffer uh, racism, not only in an institutional sense, but also in a social sense. And we can measure the damage in the following ways. Look at the infrastructure. Look at the backward agricultural system. Look at the broken educational system. Look at the massive illiteracy. Look at the ill health of the people who have been the descendants of the enslaved. These are all issues that must be repaired if these countries have a chance of having development. And also, too, these nations that were built on slavery, the whole purpose of it was to extract wealth from these people, from these communities, and transfer that wealth to the northern industrial nations. That is why slavery went on for 500 years. It was a wealth-generating machine, and the wealth went to the sources of those who control the investment. So if there's going to be sustainable development, then we have to fix these issues. And the best way to do it is a reparatory justice framework. Now, reparatory justice is necessary to attend to these current issues. And those countries who have extracted the wealth from our people, they need to return a portion of that wealth to facilitate basic development. So now we have found that African governments now equipped with the historical knowledge are able to say, we want to have a conversation around reparations. We want to talk about it. So that was one of the major seismic achievements. 
So when the African Union met at the end of last year and declared that 2025 is going to be the year of African reparations, that was a huge historic achievement that Africa has finally found its voice and the African governments have said, we are standing in solidarity with CARICOM and CARICOM and Africa will now be speaking with one voice on this matter. Major, major achievement. Well, the question still yet to be begged. Should reparations be more than just money? Sir Hillary has made an argument that it extracted wealth from the Caribbean and to a great extent has deprived uh, CARICOM nations of development goals. Unfortunately, he is making the argument, not saying that it's unfortunate his argument, but what he has put forward is very unfortunate in terms of the circumstances. He's made the argument that essentially, for example, a broken uh, education systems, healthcare systems, uh, development goals and expansionary goals, unfortunately, has not reached the levels that we hoped to achieve. Now, you know, going back to what the uh, Minister of Foreign and Caracol Affairs, Dr. Ingrun, argued, there are those who are against reparations. And we can speak about that later on when I welcome my guests. But the argument mostly made against reparations is the fact that uh, when you take a look at, and it's focused solely on Britain, again, that's a very important point, it's focused solely on Britain for the transatlantic trade slave. When you take a look at, at, at what's happening there, the argument is during uh, the, the fight for independence from former colonial states, the arguments were never made for a development plan. It was just made for political independence. That's what the arguments were. But that's why it's important to ask the question, why do reparations seem more realistic now than it did 50, 60 years ago? But moving forward with our presentations this morning, let's take a look at what BBC Africa had to put together. They collated an entire report as to reparations and how it should be viewed, righting the wrongs of colonial rule, and again, whether or not reparations is more than just about money. This report from BBC World Africa. Reparations, okay, let's do this. It's time to acknowledge openly that much of Europe and the United States have been built from the vast wealth harvested from the sweat, tears, blood and horrors of the transatlantic slave trade and the centuries of colonial exploitation. Reparations must be paid. That's Ghana's president on reparations, but what exactly are they? That means, you know, reclaiming back what they have taken from us, our pride, our dignity. It can't be repaid back. The years have been lost. Things have been damaged. The best they can do is encourage us and let us just work on our own. Monetary reparation is just one aspect of it, but it should be more moral, moral uh, aspect. Reparation is compensation, breaking the chain of bondage, and also giving back. Reparations are important. They mean different things to different people. So I've been thinking about these three questions. What are reparations? Why is it not just about getting money? And what could it look like for Africa? To get some answers, I've been speaking to human rights lawyer Andrew Songa. He's worked on reparation cases across Africa for over a decade. I think money is the most tangible and familiar uh, form of reparations within compensation, but it's not the only form of reparations um, that exists and it cannot be a holistic approach. So if it's not just about the money, what are the other forms of reparations? You have restitution being the first port of call, and restitution is about um, trying to put the person back into the position they were in before the harm they suffered. For example, if you lose your land, restitution can be giving you back that piece of land you lost. Um, if you lost cultural artifacts, as a lot of African communities have done, restitution could be returning those artifacts back to the communities they belong to. And then you also have the aspect of um, satisfaction. And the most common features of satisfaction tend to be public acknowledgements or apologies 
that perhaps a government can make. You also have rehabilitation. So for example, you have people who are wrongly accused, detained and jailed, having their criminal records expunged so that they can be able to come back into society. You also have the very important aspect of the guarantees of non-recurrence. These are measures that governments or those in power take to ensure that whatever environment allowed for violations to take place, those environments are remedied. So it could be about policy and institutional reform to ensure that we don't create future victims. When it comes to slavery or colonial rule, none of the reparation attempts so far have met all five forms. But there are historical examples of reparations in other contexts. Since World War II, Germany has paid over $90 billion to individual Holocaust survivors and their heirs. These payments continue today, with a further $1.4 billion pledged in 2023. The government also agreed to a one-off payment of $7 billion in today's money to Israel in 1952. So what about in Africa? In Nairobi, capital of Kenya, Europeans and Africans still walk the streets in fear of the dreaded Mau Mau. In 2013, the UK government agreed to pay nearly $30 million in an out-of-court settlement to Kenyans tortured by British colonial forces during the Mau Mau uprising in the 1950s. The UK government told us it had expressed regrets for the abuses committed, and that the most effective way to respond to past wrongs is by ensuring current and future generations learn lessons and work together to tackle today's challenges. In 2015, they also funded a monument commemorating the veterans. More recently, in 2021, Germany agreed to pay more than $1.3 billion after officially recognizing its colonial soldiers had committed genocide between 1904 and 1908 in Namibia. Rather than calling the payout reparations, it was called a grant instead. To understand the implications of this, I spoke to reparations activist Esther Kosei. Germany, even though it has acknowledged the over Herero and Nama genocide, is still trying to call the shots and absolve itself from as much responsibility as possible by referring to this as development aid. It is not in fulfillment or recognition of serious crimes that have been committed against a group uh, such as the crimes of genocide. Aid is something that really is down to, oftentimes, the benevolence of particular governments. It is not an obligation under international law. It is still very much, uh, dare I say, a form of charity. The German government says the payout is neither aid or reparations. The funds can't be reparations as they were made out of a moral and historical obligation rather than a legal one. These payments are not linked to any other form of development aid. The money is meant to go directly to projects in the affected communities and region where they'll decide how it's spent. Those three examples cover a specific time, group of people, and location. So, what about slavery and colonial rule? Well, momentum seems to be picking up, with demands from former colonies getting louder. In November 2023, African and Caribbean delegates got together in Ghana, demanding formal apologies from European countries. They also set up a global reparations fund, but they didn't say how it would work. How do you even put a number on something like slavery? Well, I've looked into it and several groups have tried and the figures have ranged from billions to trillions depending on how it's worked out. 20 million pounds or nearly 2.5 billion dollars in today's money. That's how much slave owners were compensated by the British government when slavery ended. A debt the UK only finished paying off in 2015 some former colonies have used the same measure to say that's how much they should be compensated. A report co-authored by top UN judge Patrick Robinson took a different approach. They calculated that over $107 trillion would need to be paid by 31 former slaveholding states. This includes Britain, the US, Spain and France. The figures based on the five harms committed during slavery and slightly after. These are loss of liberty, loss of earning, personal injury, 
gender-based violence and mental pain and anguish. But for Esther, there's a key missing piece. The report is totally silent on what is owed to Africa. The report indicates that specific sums of money should go to countries in the diaspora, that is outside of Africa. It is very disproportionate because it implies and it reinforces a fiction that the harm was just done to those of us that were taken out of the continent. It doesn't recognize the harm that those who remained in Africa, what they suffered. The question of who should pay has been divisive. Should it be nation states or individual organizations like churches and universities that have historical links? And who should receive the payments? For Esther, it's important that descendants like her on the continent and outside have a voice in reparation talks. We have never been uh, asked as to whether we consent to existing governments, whether in Africa or anywhere else, to actually negotiate finite sums of money on behalf of our four parents. Despite all the unresolved questions, for Esther and Andrew, collective reparations are worth pursuing. I understand the hesitation sometimes that comes with thinking about the sheer scale. You can't truly ever quantify um, a lost life uh, and, and, and fully um, atone for it, or you can't contemplate fully um, what it means to destroy a culture or what it means to break apart a community. We can see that the debate of reparations is indeed picking up and that some of the Global North countries are being responsive. It is important to consolidate these experiences and therefore say um, what you are beginning to acknowledge is actually depictive of the experience of the whole continent and we can therefore move forward and um, discuss and make the claims for reparations as a continent towards um, some of the former colonial states. Reparations are actually complex. They are not just a simple matter of paying back some money. We lost a lot more than money. The first thing that communities want is to be heard, to be listened to. Much of the ongoing crimes and violations of African people's rights on the continent of Africa, first of all, are not being recognized. With increasing calls for reparations in Africa, some institutions like museums have started returning stolen artifacts. Recently, more European nations have started to recognize their role in the legacy of slavery and colonial era violence. But it remains to be seen whether there will be real political commitments to meaningful reparation talks. Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to take a break now on AM Prime, but when we return, we're going to bring the conversation back to Trinidad and Tobago and by extension, CARICOM. Bearing in mind, it is National Reparations Week here in TNT. We take a break, ladies and gentlemen. to the program ladies and gentlemen thank you for being with us this morning as we uh, focus our conversation on reparations and recognition of TNT's uh, National Reparations Week now to bring the conversation back uh, to Trinidad and Tobago and by extension uh, CARICOM I'm pleased to welcome to the program an individual who is a board member uh, of the Emancipation Support Committee but has, is an expert in public policy and that's very important as part of this conversation and in part of the efforts of governments, be it Trinidad and Tobago and CARICOM. Dr. Asha Kamon is my guest this morning. Good morning, Dr. Kamon, and welcome to AM Prime. Good morning, good morning. Pleasure to be here well, and to all the listeners. Well, thank you very much for joining us indeed. Now, let me start by, by asking you, uh, earlier this, this year at uh, the uh, Emancipation Sport Committee's Kwame II Memorial Lecture, it was stated uh, that reparations must, as far as possible, wipe out all the consequences of the illegal act and re-establish the situation which would, 
in all probability have existed if that act had not been committed. This is very important to understand exactly how do reparations wipe out the consequences of the illegal act of transatlantic slavery. Okay, so that's a tough one, huh? It's, it's, it, to do so requires us to, and this is why the language of reparatory justice has come into the process, because reparatory justice suggests that you, it's not that you're trying to, um, what's the word, to get every piece of the puzzle that was there before put back in the same place. Uh, that's not the idea. The idea is that you uh, agree with those who have created the harm um, uh, for them to be able to, uh, for you to be able to agree with them what is the value of that harm and then for you to be able to embark based on their reparatory justice, you can embark on the correcting of that harm. You can uh, embark on addressing that harm. Um, you know, it uh, very interestingly, the, the, the Jewish community, um, based on what occurred in Germany and the Holocaust, they received reparatory justice. They were given billions and billions and billions and billions of dollars to repair the harm of the Holocaust. Mm -hmm. And of course, it didn't mean being able to put back together the lives of those people who lost their lives. You, you can't, you know, get those bones out of the grave and do something with them now. But what it meant is that the community uh, of, of, uh, of the Jewish uh, community was then able to take those resources and address the issues of their mental well-being their psychosocial trauma that they experienced, and their own um, uh, economic development, which, as we've seen, they have done quite well with, um, with the State of Israel, which is still being supported by um, uh, reparations, which are being paid to them on an annual basis. Mm -hmm. So, in, in essence, we should not think that when we are talking about repairing the harm and damage that has been done as a result of the ill effects of the transatlantic slave trade, um, and, and which is the trafficking in human beings, taking them uh, and, and and owning them and, and trying to, 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 to manage them as chattel, as property. Um, the harm that that has caused to both the, the community, um, the individuals who are members of that community, the inherited harm, and to the environment and the, the society that they live in. We, we you know, we, Climate justice is an interesting um, component of reparations because uh, take, for instance, Barbados, you know, it is when you read about Barbados, the first thing you learn is, is that it is the most water scarce island or the most water scarce country in the world. How did little Barbados become so water scarce? Every single tree was cut down for the advancement of the, uh, of the planting of sugar, of the sugar cane. You know, I mean, the, the, the country was stripped of its forest resources to be able to make it a plantation economy. And we talk sometimes when you're talking about development of Haiti, uh, everyone says to you, oh, but the hills are all destroyed. You can see the green in Dominican Republic. But what happened to the green in, in Haiti? As if Haitians themselves uh, destroyed this, um, you know, uh, willy nilly. Unfortunately, that was part of the reparations, which Haiti had to pay to France. What well, there's the absurdity of it, because um, they freed themselves, and, and, and since they were deemed to be property uh, of the French, they had to pay uh, the French for their own um, uh, freedom. But then, so, uh, Doctor so, Camel, so then but wider context. But but then, in the in the context of the conversation, still. Who decides exactly what the definition of justice, again, in the context of the conversation, who decides oh. what the definition of justice is? You have those who uh, uh, have fought for reparations, and you have those who have stood against the idea of reparations. And when I say against the idea, I'm, I'm speaking about governments, not necessarily individuals. Mm -hmm. Of course, there will always be governments who feel reparatory justice is not something that um, that ought to be uh, supported. Um, 
um, that's not an unusual thing. Um, uh, what is it? How can I say it like this? I mean, if you, uh, if, if somebody has been, been uh, um, gaining amazing wealth and their wealth is based on your labor, your free labor, and the resources which they've been able to extract from your environment, then would they be happy to pay reparations? Would they be happy to agree? Um, I don't think so. Um, and this is uh, whether they are uh, from the British or the Dutch or the um, any other any other of the industrial nations who uh, whose wealth and resources um, were were derived uh, from the trafficking of human beings and the enslavement of them and the extraction of the resources from their land. Mm -hmm. But does does reparations begin? with, with uh, slavery? Does it begin with enslavement in Africa? Or does it go beyond that? Um, interestingly, I mean, okay, okay, we are talking about reparations for the transatlantic slave trade. Mm -hmm. So that, but let's say that you have the reparations, the many other communities in this world have re demanded reparations for the harm caused to them. So Africans um, and, and those of us who live in the um, in the Western Hemisphere, have certainly not been the first to do so, um, and uh, we are talking about not just um, reparations for the transatlantic slave trade, but also for the genocide to the indigenous people who lived here. And remember, the indigenous people, the First Nation people, as they are called in North America and in Canada, they too have been demanding reparations for the harm caused to them and their communities as a result of this. Um, this invasion uh, by uh, Columbus and his crew, this, 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 this these, uh, um, what shall I call them, Mom? I mean, you don't want to say uh, this was a greedy and rape, uh, uh, you know, crew that, that just destroyed, um, you know, people's uh, life and their lifestyles and their livelihoods. And that was before they actually um, brought uh, Africans into, trafficked Africans into the Western Hemisphere. They were um, destroying the indigenous people and continued to do so. Uh, just recently, I'm sure you would have seen the, the article in the newspaper where um, uh, the, the the schools, uh, the mission schools in North America, they, they because the, you know these archives are now being unearthed, but the archives actually said they were able to see the um, the information that said that the plan for these mission schools was that not only would they be, uh, eliminate the culture of the indigenous people of North America by bringing these children into these mission schools, but it would also allow them to take the land, the last remaining bits and pieces of reservations that these people lived on. So uh, the Western civilization has not been a, you know, it's not a tea party um, to reach where they have reached now. And the peoples who are now discovering the, the, the information, who knew all along actually, but now are finding the, the evidence that speaks to the trauma that they've experienced and the, um, uh, the deliberate, the very deliberate, I mean, not um, by any chance, um, uh, happen chance. This was not a happen chance affair. This was a very deliberate uh, process. And uh, people are now discovering the documentation and the evidence that supports what these communities have said all along. Um, um, and now that evidence can be used in the uh, global courts, in the courts, uh, humanitarian courts, to um, support the call for social justice and reparatory justice. Well, I'm, I'm glad and that you've spoken of social justice because uh, to a large extent, the conversation on reparations has, has focused on bridging the, the economic inequalities between the Western world and the Caribbean, CARICOM in particular. However, uh, there, there seems to be a lack of understanding as to exactly how reparations uh, may bridge the, the social, uh, psychological, uh, and, and sociological inequality uh, be between uh, the Western world and, uh, and of course, those post and, and, and colonial nations. Uh, exactly how does it benefit these nations okay. sociologically and psychologically? Okay, you know, part of reparations is not just the economics of it. That, yeah. that is a big part, that's, that, that, that's fundamental. But the other part is the psychosocial component of it. it is, we talk about in reparations self-repair. 
um, when you are disconnected completely from your your roots, um, as so many African people who are in the um, Western Hemisphere, um, without knowledge of, sometimes not even with knowledge of who their great 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 grandparents were, and other peoples can go right back and trace their great grandparents. Uh, that's a, that, that that's a, a real harm when you think about it. You you cannot say for sure where these people came from, and that trauma of not being able to identify those those bits and pieces of your your uh, what makes you human, what makes you um, uh, that gives you the the sense of who you are in this world, where you where you are situated, um, those that bit of self repair. Um, has to be done, and um, our own uh, countries who in this part of the world we have to um, provide a lot of. Um, it, it requires a lot of support. It requires a, a lot of research. It requires sharing that research within the education system, so that half the population does not think that the other half is barbaric and came from nowhere. You've got to have a population where each side is able to feel comfortably that they understand the other. We, we, that, is, that is why we, are, we have a lot of conflict in our uh, societies, in Western society as well. Huh? And remember, it's not um, just as Africans in the Caribbean, but right across um, uh, South America, right across North America, both the African and indigenous communities are saying, um, we have to put an end to this notion that we are somehow um, less less than than others, and the only way to put a no, uh, uh, put that to sleep is that we've got to be able to do the research. We've got to be able to show um, uh, what our civilizations were like before um, this disruption that has been caused by the transatlantic slave trade. Why has the focus been though primarily uh, on on the British? I mean, major players in the transatlantic trade slave included the Portuguese, the, the Spanish, the, the French, the Dutch. Why has the conversation focused more so on the British? Well, I think it, it's uh, those of us who are uh, speaking the loudest um, <laughs> come from the English-speaking Caribbean. Um, but if you landed in, in, um, in Brazil, the African community in Brazil are badgering the, the Portuguese. Um, if you land in... Uh, in, in Curaçao or Aruba or Suriname, you will find that um, the communities there are badgering the Dutch. That's why the, um, uh, the Dutch gave somewhat of an apology. And, and now they're talking about um, looking at, at various methods for, for reparations. None of it, uh, the, 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 the communities in Suriname and Curaçao and Aruba and Bonaire and so on, they're not, um, you know, uh, they're not happy with where it's going, but they are pushing, pushing, pushing. The Germans as well. If you go to the southern part of Africa, the Nama people, I'm sure you would have seen and heard of the Nama and Herero people who are demanding reparations from the Germans because of the uh, the genocide, the first genocide that was committed that, that we have recorded information about. And they're probably um, other genocides that we just don't have the recorded information. But we have the genocide of the Herero and the um, Nama peoples um, by the Germans in the southern um, part of, of, um, of Africa, um, where they were put into concentration camps uh, and left to starve to death. What we are witnessing now in Palestine was, was practiced uh, uh, among the Herero and the Nama's peoples. They were, they were set aside. They were enclosed. They were left in the desert. To, to to starve and, and and then eventually to be slaughtered mm -hmm. so it, it, the history of the world it, is not a um as i you know i have to say to people sometimes it's not a tea party um development did not happen um through um you know smart investment and you know the discussions around tables and policies being decided quite generously and so on no this was a cutthroat uh, and bloody affair and unfortunately, it occurred on the backs of, of, of many 
uh, of our ancestors. How do we decide though how reparations will be distributed? Uh, we haven't even gotten to that point of achieving reparations as yet. There have been mm -hmm. some progress, for example, uh, a, a, you know, a memorandum between the University of Glasgow uh, and the University of the West Indies. Uh, and that sum for research and development was actually about uh, 20 million pounds, the same amount that was uh, paid to, to former uh, slave owners over time. But how do we decide how reparations will be distributed? That's a great question. That's, that falls into my, um, that really falls into my uh, area of considerations. Um, we, we have to have uh, a lot of conversation we have to, governments have to be prepared to speak with their people. Um, it, it, the decisions about how reparations are distributed certainly cannot happen behind cl closed doors. Um, we all have to be engaged in the process, and that's why it's very important for all peoples to understand how and what reparatory justice is all about. Um, it was never intended um, for reparatory justice or reparations to be paid to individuals. That was never a consideration. Um, when you look at what is happening in North America now, a lot of states like California, like Washington, D.C., um, other states, many states, are trying to come to terms with their own uh, period of enslavement. Um, universities are trying to come to terms and come to grips. And, and, and as the evidence is, is, is becoming clear, they're beginning to understand the grave harm that, that, that was done as a result of, um, of, of, of their involvement in enslavement and the continuing harm. That's a, that's a point we have to make about reparations. It's not just for that period of enslavement huh? and the trafficking in human beings and the genocide to, 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 to indigenous people. If, I mean, that's a lot already, but it is the continuing harm that was, that was done uh, and continues to be done, you know, until we all agree that this has to end and that uh, reparatory justice has to take place and that we are able to um, identify uh, what the arrive and agree at what sum is required um, to be paid. Um, and then those of us on this side of the water, we have to be engaged in the process. And that's why uh, reparations is about education. It is about education. We have to ensure that all the population understands what it looked like, what the harm looked like. Otherwise, if, if some people think, oh, that was no big thing, and you should be grateful that they grabbed you out of the continent of Africa and brought you here, because maybe for some mysterious religion that you've been given, and, and that you should be happy for that, and therefore you don't need reparations. If that's how the society is thinking, then we're going to have a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of uh, difficulty and challenges in deciding how best reparations should be used. So uh, reparations, as part of it, has always been about education. We've got to share the knowledge, the information about the harm caused, who caused it, for how long, how have we suffered as a result of it, and so on. Mm -hmm. Dr. Carmon, uh, yeah. well, well, if, if we focus on ourselves, do you think that we have uh, lagged in terms of this fight and this conversation. It's really picked up in the last three to five years. But if I uh, take a look at, at independence fights across the, the, the Caribbean, it focused more so on political freedom rather than a post-colonial development plan. Do you think that, that we actually fell short in our arguments when we focused more so on political freedom then rather than speaking about reparations as part of a development plan? You know, when you look back, <laughs> in hindsight, you know, hindsight gives you 2020 vision. When we look back at, 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 our, um, uh, at those and, and, and the processes for, for freedom, um, for independence, let's say, um, especially in the English-speaking Caribbean, um, it, it, wasn't a, it wasn't as fulfilling as it should have been. There were those at the time who wanted a, a full uh, disclosure, so to speak, and a real break with the colonial past. And there were those whose education and, and, um, and uh, what shall I say, uh, if you even want to call it education, but their, 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 brain, their brain arrangements were, 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 were such that 
um, that they had not, they didn't envisage a, a more, um, a deeper break with, with the colonial past. Um, and, and with that deeper break, I meant uh, the, the complete transformation um, of our education system. Um, and that has not happened. Um, the transformation of our education system has not occurred. And it's, uh, it's, it's a, it's a, that's a big, big problem um, for us as we continue to, to grow and advance. Yeah, so yes, yes, they made that error and not, um, some tried, I mean, you know, there was a lot of, remember that was a very, um, a period of a lot of upheaval, but, but, but the colonials were very, um, they were on top of it. They felt, let's not let this thing get to um, reach that level of discord and discourse. Let's, let's grant this so-called independence as quickly as possible so that we can continue controlling the processes. Mm-hmm. And that's why maybe there weren't those, um, those kind of development uh, and repar- reparatory arrangements made at that period. Mm-hmm. And my final question to you, Dr. Cameron, is why do reparations seem more realistic today than it did during those conversations of independence? You know, it's an interesting thing. Reparations did not start today. Huh? We, we have to be very mindful of that. As the minute that people, um, even while they were enslaved, and sometimes as soon as they managed to escape slavery, uh, you have letters being written by enslaved people who ran away from slavery to the people who enslaved them saying listen you owe me money you owe me um things that uh, these are some of the things that were taken from me while you use my labor for free and um i i I demand that reparatory justice Uh, so that so there's not um it is wrong it is a misconception let's put it that way to think that reparations the discourse on reparations only started yesterday and even in our modern period, we have to go back to the year 2000, when the last conference was held um, on the, the global conference on race was held in uh, South Africa. And our countries argued at, at that conference um, that indeed, and that was 2000, huh? that indeed slavery was a crime against humanity. Um, it was then and it continue it, it, it is now and it was with that global recognition that enslavement was a crime against humanity that we were able to put reparations on the global agenda and the caribbean yes was was um very um what's the word very instrumental in in getting that perspective um on the global agenda during that conference and and it, they, you know really we so we got to get some university student to write a thesis about the conference on its whole and and the caribbean's um role in that conference so yes so reparatory justice and discourse on on reparations didn't start now um, even in the modern period we're talking about the year 2000 and we are in 2024 so that's a good distance away but even during the period of enslavement there are letters there are there's evidence of people demanding um, reparations. And by the way, there were people who demanded to be returned. And the right of return is a a part of reparatory justice. And there were people who demanded to be returned to the continent after um, enslavement was over. So that you do have, um, um, what's the word? You do have communities on the continent that are made up of people who had left the Caribbean and went to the continent to, uh, to, to live. So um, that is also part of uh, the struggle for reparations. Indeed. Dr. Camon, I want to thank you very much for your time this morning and for joining us on the conversation, shedding some light on the issues and also bringing clarity uh, to some rather confusing elements as part of this conversation. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much. It's been my pleasure. And uh, I look forward to lending more clarity whenever necessary if i can certainly indeed thank you so very much keep well take care bye ladies and gentlemen we take a break here on am prime we will return shortly as we continue this morning's edition and to continue the conversations we'll be right back
again as we welcome to AM Prime, Ricardo Mead of the Elsicor Centre for Wildlife Conservation. And before we even get to that shot, oftentimes I'm rather surprised as to the animals that Ricardo brings, you know, whether it be the smallest of the creatures, because we, we had a snake that it fits comfortably within the palm of my hand. Uh, we've had a tarantula on the program, pretty sure you've seen that before. Um, but today he's brought some big guns because I, before I even saw this animal, he told me the name is Zeus. And once you know that something or someone is named Zeus, sand back a bit. And that's exactly... I pushed my chair a little bit away from Ricardo and my director, Ryan gomez book just pushed me right back. In fact, I think he pushed me closer. Ladies and gentlemen, Ricardo Mead is with Zeus this morning. Take a look at the size of this fella. Whoa, <laughs> look at this guy. Good morning, Ricardo. Good morning, how are you? I'm doing well, how are you? I am doing absolutely fantastic here with my, uh, my tyrant. Tyrant indeed. Uh, before we even get us to, to exactly who Zeus is, look at the size of those talons. Whoa. <laughs> yeah, those are, those are the big guns. They're some of the largest we have in the, in the country. And um, he can do you some damage there with um, with, that, with that stuff there. He can certainly do some damage. He, he's got a death stare, by the way. Uh, his yeah. eyes are, I, mean, I, I don't know if you guys are seeing his eyes right now, but wow. Ricardo, who is Zeus? Zeus is a black hawk eagle. So he's a bit hawk of a eagle. wannabe. Yeah, he's a wannabe. He's a hawk, but he wants to be an eagle. So he has an amazing wingspan, an amazing size. He's a good two, two and a half pounds here. And it doesn't sound like much, but when you're holding him on your hand like that and with the power in those talons, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a hell of a, a, a bird to have sitting on your hand. Yeah, you this ain't, this ain't no so parrot. No, you almost also going to be so later. Yeah, this ain't no parrot. I can tell you that for sure. <laughs> Not even a macaw. He's a big bad guy, also known as a tyrant hawk. I can probably guess why. Right, so the name... Is a, was an easy choice. Uh, Zeus. I'm, I'm, it, it's the death stare. It's, he, it's the death yes. stare. That's just, it's, his eyes are mesmerizing, but it's that yeah. stare. Well, you know, eyes like a hawk. Well, this guy is, you know, transfixed. He's, he's keeping you in mind for so many evil things, possibly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, hold, on to, hold on to that, please. Yeah, hold on to this. Okay, all right. We hold on to this here. <laughs> no, but, know, but insurance. a bit more as per why he's referred to as a hawk eagle. Well, hawks have a particular um, stature in terms of physical size, and eagles do. With like the largest eagle being the um, stellar sea eagle with a wingspan of over eight feet. That is massive. That's huge. All right, so his, his wingspan isn't, isn't anywhere near six. I think the hawks, um, the eagles usually start at five and a half, six. He is a little about four, four and something feet as a wingspan. Um, and it, but it's a powerful bird. In Brazil, they're known as uh, monkey hawks because they literally grab monkeys. The squirrel monkeys and even baby howler monkeys, they'll grab off the backs of their mothers. Off uh, the backs, oh. Yeah, and go and um, kill them and eat them. So when you see these talons, you can understand how easy it is for something like this. Are you okay? He seems to have a good yeah, grip on you. Yeah, then. yeah. We hope he just stays calm enough. Um, he's a new guy and he's with us because um, he's been with us for a few months. But it has been determined now. He's had a couple of visits. Now he's fascinated by something up there. A couple of visits to the, um, the animal ophthalmologist. And it has been determined that this guy is blind in his left eye. Oh, okay. All right. So there is no way that he can function in the wild. Uh, because if he goes after, for example, a parrot and he grabs the feathers, that's not a meal. And he will always be this close. Mm -hmm. But because they have natural binocular vision, the loss of one eye, it comes like a human being wearing a patch on one side. So now you have to find a way to keep turning your head to try to focus, and you will never get the exact um, you know, trajectory to get to your food. So the animals will keep getting away, and he will stop. So basically, he cannot hunt with one eye. Mm. So he is now relegated to being an ambassador. There's no way we're going to allow uh, an animal like this to, to go down. He, well, first of all, kudos to an animal ophthalmologist who had to give Zeus an <laughs> exam. <laughs> well yeah, done. she, um, yeah, Dr. Dr. Williams is, um, 
you know, always fascinated when he, when he comes in because actually it's the second one that she saw and I gave it an eye issue and she was like, wow, this, this, this animal is, is really is something else. You know, and he's turning that way. So he's away from the camera really for the most part because, um, you know, he's using his good eye to see. Um, but if we go from this side, there is nothing. He doesn't yeah. react to anything from on this side. How does um, it also affect his ability to fly though? Um, unless he is targeting something or going into a very small area, he would be able to see. Um, it would be like, if, just imagine if for yourself, if your one eye is blocked out, you're driving on the highway, not a problem. Um, but if you have to back up and maneuver in a car park and amongst people, you might miss one or two. <laughs> so you might bump over or run over a couple of people. So he is, you know, ad adapting and adjusting well. Um, he might be looking to fly, so I'm going to just sort of literally clamp down here as he looks around. Um, you have to, dealing with the animals, really forget about you and what you would normally do and tune yourself into the animal and its behavior. Right now, I'm actually trying to remember my insurance, if it's up to date or not. Right. <laughs> well, we do have um, some, some bandages and so on in have the car. You, have, you ever, <laughs> have you actually ever gotten one of those talons on you? Um, uh, late last week, he got my head. He got your but, head? Yeah, um, because he's in a perch, and I was bending down to release him, to, to pick him up. And um, again, when you're on the blind side, you're kind of okay. But if he turns and suddenly he picks you up, he reacts. So he didn't, his, his foot in it, that's what it's called when they use their feet. People are worried about their beak. It's the feet, the talons are the deadly part. He just sort of footed to remind you, hey, you know, here I am, you surprised me, you can't sneak up on me like that. So we have a sort of mutual respect. I usually let him see me, hear my voice, and you know, literally tell him, okay, I'm coming to get you, I'm coming to get you, I'm picking you up. So he he's kind of gets accustomed to a routine, basically just hearing my voice in a particular tone, yeah. so he doesn't get startled. Um, when he gets startled, he can be quite the handful. Just imagine him flopping around with the wings, and then the talons trying to hold on to something. Um, I remind the people about the eagle who took out a girl's eye. She was trying to handle it. Of course, she handled it, but she dropped her arm. So it should be held like this. Um, if your arm drops, the bird thinks it's falling. First thing that goes is, is it throws out its wings to prevent itself from falling. And then it now tries with its feet to get to higher ground or hold on. So it went from the glove to her shoulder to one foot on the head and the other foot literally hooking her in the face and into her eyeball. Wow. Uh, it's, I'm picturing yeah, this imagine, in my head. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, it's, you, it's something that he would probably do in a, a kind of horror movie, yeah. but it, it, actually, it actually happens. Wow. And I've seen um, some of our volunteers when they get too comfortable sometimes with some of the raptors and the birds literally try to get up on their head. And I tell them, you're lucky that bird has tiny feet compared to something like this. Well, he actually, uh, uh, point of note, probably has one of the coolest hairstyles I've seen on, on he's, he's got like a, a mohawk sort of thing going on there. Yeah, his, his crest is, his crest is quite, quite something there. Um, that's it. I'm paying attention to you. I'm looking at you. You know, don't think that you're getting away with anything. So when he is very comfortable, it will go back down. Really? Oh, okay. Yeah. Whoops, he's gone he's up there. a bit. Uh -huh. My voice was a bit too. Right. So anytime I see him. Uh, sort of raise his head and start to look around is when I sort of more clamp down yeah. and in control because right now he's on the edge of my glove. Um, this being a hawk glove and him being a hawk eagle, he has a wider stance, being a bigger bird. So that means the, my glove, which I will be ordering, should be all the way to my elbow right. to prevent um, him footing me and ripping my flesh and drawing blood in that area. He also, another point of note, he's He's turned his head uh, throughout our conversation so far, but it, it goes beyond 180 degrees. Yeah, 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 because now what they do, they, that's their, their natural predatory behavior. They would stand on a perch, some dead tree pretty high up, and they would literally pan like a camera, look around, look out to see what's happening there. They're not going to spend their time flying around looking for food. That wastes energy. Then you'll have to find a way to eat to make up for that energy, to find food, and then to eat, and it just is a cycle. So to break the cycle, they stand, just as much as they're doing, and they just use their head and they just look. And based on, um, remember I've told you before, there's something called biomimicry. So we have designed systems that mimic stuff that we've seen in nature. 
um, the camera doesn't have to move around the room. The camera is in one spot, mm -hmm. but it can do something called panning. Mm -hmm. Right, so we have security system where the camera just pans from left to right, left to right, much like the head of the hawk or other birds of prey when they are looking for something. So stationary, so not a lot of energy. The camera, you don't have to figure out a complex real system to move the camera, but just the head of it just sort of pivots on a, you know, almost like a gyroscope. So it's really, really cool what we have done, seen and based on what the animals have done. And he's there looking up again, and that's that's the part where I get a little concerned because when they want to go up is when they are. Um, they start to. Yeah, those wings will go out, and then he launches. So I'm gonna literally hold on to this really tight. You know, it'll be interesting if I can probably if I can just swing my hand a bit, and get to see him the other way, the other eye. Yeah, well, he's really very wary. He is. Very wary. You know what's my favorite part of them really? Besides the eyes. What's that? His pants. His. <laughs> <laughs> Look at his pants. He's got these amazing, amazing like pajamas, <laughs> right? Long sleeves. Most birds you would have seen before do not actually no, have that. They, they have. Don't. You see the color of their leg all the way up. But is is there specific purpose that is? Um, yeah. no, not that we could say particularly. It could have something to do with their prey. Um, a lot of them would use that for sort of protection a bit when they go after their monkeys and their squirrels and so on that can bite. So that gives them a little protection. It comes like long sleeve, short sleeve. If you're going in the bush, through razor grass and elephant grass and so on, donkey grass, long sleeves might be the best option. So what are you feeding him? He loves rats. But are you live feeding him? Uh, no, 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 no. I know he can't hunt, but you right. can't because well, we can in a, in a controlled environment like where the center is on his enclosure, he can take down a live rat. But we're not taking the chance because the rat would, if he doesn't get the proper grip on his prey, rats are very sharp teeth and can injure him. And then we have to treat that also. Yeah. So we would stun or kill and then allow him to eat the mm -hmm. rat. But we try to give him whole and he does an amazing job of literally ripping that apart. Because if, if I were to take a look at owls, for example, they tend to swallow mice whole. Yeah, mice. But yes. he... He eats just large prey. Larger prey, the yeah, rats, he, he just goes, yeah. Yeah, he will even eat an agouti. Mm -hmm. you know, so you have agouti, you have monkeys, squirrels, all that he will take down. You have snakes, iguanas, and nothing for him to take down. And I'm talking big iguanas, not little tiny ones. So he's quite a powerful predator. He's like really the king of the woods. He's really the tyrant. You tyrant know, indeed. as he goes, everybody else has to, you know. And I had the, the, the pleasure of seeing one in the wild for quite a while. I was taking lots of pictures of it. I think I took 96 pictures of it. Wow. But the camera wasn't the very best. It was a little point and shoot. So I got a little zoomy and it was a little shaky and so on. But he came literally to the center and it literally freaked us out because a volunteer was like, since when Kobo has come so close down by the building? Co and I looked and I said, Kobo? And I looked and I was like, oh, 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 that, 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 that is not a Kobo. <laughs> Ran inside, got this camera, taking pictures. He flew up, went up on a high spot, and he just stayed there. So I took picture after picture. And he was looking around, looking around. And then he decided, now is the time. And he took off, and he took a dive into the canopy because the tree was a little above the canopy. Then you hear the bawling and the squawking. He went after and grabbed the parrot. Oh. And you saw the next parrot just flying around frantically, just flapping and bawling. Oh, God, oh, God, oh, God, oh, God, oh, God, oh, God, oh, God. And he was with the other one there, and he flew off to another tree. And then you just saw feathers. Feathers, feathers. You Killed saw it. all of that? Saw all of that. Just saw the feathers. It was just such a distance. You just see the feathers floating on. There's green feathers just floating on. He's plucking it, plucking it. And he just, you know, I guess the disturbance was a little too much. He went to another tree, and that's where we lost him. But he wow. grabbed. We didn't see the grab because it went into the canopy. The parrots were in the tree. We couldn't even see the parrots because of green. But he went in there and grabbed one. But you saw the other one just flying around frantically, just screaming. Because they're in pairs usually. Yes. It's screaming. And then he came up to that tree there with the parrot there. And I, we were like, oh my goodness. If for the want of a 13,000 US dollar lens on a Canon camera, we would have gotten some amazing shots. Yeah, that's how much those big lens cost. And I know very well because I saw like, wow, look at this, how much is it? <gasps> okay, let's keep moving along. Photography gotta is get, not gotta get that, for that, me. That, as Trini say, flim, you know, and then yep. you got a rule. <laughs> yep, yep. But, but that is incredible, nature could be so, cruel but fascinating yeah. that's that's nature that's nature yeah. for you uh I, I say cruel in the sense that when we think about it but that's just how it is yeah. that, that, that he has to eat he has to but where in trinidad is he usually found um 
They are more found in the south. All specimens that we have observed and pictures of and encountered have come from the south. Now, when you say from the south, any specific part, for example? Um, uh, Point Fortin, Siparia, Palo Seco, parts of Pinal area, down, down south in that area, you would find these guys. So it's believed that they do come across from, um, from Venezuela based on where they're usually found. Um, because, yeah, there are records of them here. You know, this one obviously in my hand did come from here. And he came from, um, I believe, it's the Palo Seco region. Right? But that, I think, is, is sad. But um, they will also go after people's chicken. Mm. And um, so there are conflicts between people and the birds. They don't care that this is an amazing rare bird. You're coming after my chicken. So that's what they would use as, not an excuse, but that's their reasoning for trying to destroy them. And it is um, quite sad. Uh, whereas in the, the um, ornate hawk eagle, which is the other one we have, is found more, all reports thus far have been in the north. And we had some amazing pictures that were posted um, by a local photographer, I think Foster was his name. I'm, I'm not 100% I'm not sure, I can't remember his name right now. I know a few of the photographers. It was, um, it held a pigeon, not a pigeon, a toucan down on the road and it was killing, it killed and ate the toucan. You hear the whole fuss and Ew. the pictures, the footage was just amazing. I mean, I love toucans, but that opportunity to see a bird take down and kill and eat a toucan was just, you know, wow. amazing. Amazing. That's a, that's a life, that's a once in a lifetime experience. And you would also there. think that the toucan with the size of its beak would have, but nothing could match these no, talents. Yeah, no match for a bird this size. With him grabbing him out of a tree and taking it to the ground, it was just like, no match. No challenge the, at all. The ornate hawk eagle has a yellow curved beak. Is it yellow? It might might be more 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 yellowish, but it's a brownish color, um, a buff brownish color, and he has um, he has a crest. His crest is a little more prominent than this, and he has black. So yes, it's very pretty. The thing is, I, I and I think I mentioned this to you before. I did see at the University of the West Indies campus in St. Augustine, just mm -hmm. randomly one day driving around. It was sitting on one of the, the bins in, in this field. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, 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 it was fascinating. It was a, quite a large predatory bird. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, uh, not, uh, yeah, I'm an amateur, so I couldn't see if it's a hawk or a needle. Right. Um, but probably his size are a bit bigger. Just mm -hmm. sitting there, I was absolutely fascinated. So I'm thinking about the story you were saying about the ornate horse eagle, you know, in the north right versus him in the south but it, it could be that it could be a savannah but the records of the north um the the, the ornate would be more blanche shares mm. lalaha paria north re, coast. No, northern literally northern range up yeah. there on, on that side um but these birds like right now my arms are screaming back to gas black to gas literally screaming i had to literally put it onto my other arm I'm there that. Um, yeah, okay. and his tail is touching it so i will um yeah there we go you just give you a chance to see he's adjusting i adjusted so he's adjusted a little bit there you got a chance to see also. that wingspan as well yeah yeah it's not long and sharp like a falcon's horn it's more rounded but he is adapted for there we go see him there right much adapted for all right i'll let that one go a bit much more right i'll bring it back up I'm more comfortable again. He's more comfortable. Much more adapted for flying in the forest. That's his world. Um, so his wings wouldn't be as large as other birds, but it's, it's rounded but powerful. Powerful. So he's able to swoop between trees and so on, kind of like the harpy eagle, and grab that. He does look like a harpy eagle. Yes. A, a, a rather adolescent harpy eagle. Yeah. Well, we had someone call us one time and told us, we had a harpy eagle. You know, he sent a picture. I said, that's a uh, black hawk eagle, an amazing bird. But it's not a happy eagle. If you ever get the opportunity to see a happy eagle, I saw it in person. Right. Incredible. That yeah. that is just. Yeah. Well, that was part of our trip. Um, that's the national bird and symbol for Panama. So when we visited Panama, we had uh, a visit to Summit Zoo and Botanical Gardens, where the happy or the happy as they call it is their prominent. You know, you see the, the emblem of it everywhere mm -hmm. in a, a sort of um, traditional. Um, artwork and so on. It's just an amazing bird to encounter. And the, the story of all their breeding them and trying to conserve them, that's even more amazing. Oh, that wow. um, We've recognized that and we're trying to do a, a change, bring about a change and save the animals. So that is good, very good for the, for the eagle, which is um, the most, is considered the most powerful bird of prey in the world.
It's oh, not yeah. the largest, but it's definitely the most powerful. Yeah. The feet, the talons are about three and a half inches long. Known for picking deer up in the in the jungles of, of the Amazon. Yeah, they just you know, and well, monkeys are normal. primary. Yeah. yeah, normal thing. See that again with the these the talons. talons. I give you a stand. These talons. Yeah. Yeah. Look at this stare. He's yeah, looking at he's you. Like, he's yeah, like, what he's are you like, doing? Mm -hmm, yeah. He's like, I'm going for that head again. Yeah. We we're not doing that today. We're just gonna relax him. We're just relaxing. him. Okay. Well, listen. We uh, yeah. I mean, uh, we don't have much time left, but I will tell you that since we started doing Wild Wednesday, mm -hmm. you've been bringing a lot of birds. I don't know if it, it has anything to do with being more conscious or aware, mm -hmm. but I'm seeing more and more predatory birds across the NT now. Right? That's how it works. Yeah. The more you know, you know, the more you grow, you will see what you would take. For example, you would have seen dozens of blackbirds and they would all be Kobo for you. Now, suddenly you will see one with a red head. Oh my gosh, that's a turkey vulture. I've heard about that, now I'm seeing it. And oh my gosh, that's, it has white bands on the tail. That's a zone tail hawk. And you just, you just grow. That's what the education is about. That's what the learning process is about. And you just, you just have to experience it that way. So for many viewers out there, this is the experience with this hawk. And then I wouldn't be surprised if I get more calls um, from the southern region saying, hey, we've seen that, or there's a pear nesting, I believe, around in the forest. And it's just, it's just amazing. And when you know about something, that's when you can love it, you can appreciate it, and then you can protect it. As we close record, because I also want to give you a rest from your arm there. To, <laughs> uh, any final messages for the viewing public on this bird in particular? This, um, this is, uh, put this way, if we didn't uh, choose the toucan for our um, icon bird, this would have been our icon bird. This is an, an amazing animal. And, you know, there, there's a story with, with us. They go back. We tried to save one many years ago. It was shot um, down from down point fort inside and we were trying to get it to the U.S. to have surgery done. Um, we wouldn't try to do that now because it, it's, 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 it's important for me now to, to recognize that what we had to send away before, we are now capable of doing a lot of this stuff locally. And um, the bird died hours before its flight to the U.S. Wow. You know, and a lot of things had to be done. He had to get a, a diplomatic passport, basically to circumvent a lot of the process to get him into the US. But literally hours before he was to board that Cal flight, he passed away. Yeah. Now, uh, we don't have to wait on anybody. Um, we have a lot of advisors abroad that can advise us, but we have local talent, doctors who have been doing this for several years with us. And um, case like this comes in, and we're gonna be right on it all over it. They become amazing avian specialists, and uh, we respect those vets a lot for what they have done here with very little. Indeed. Ricardo Mead, thank you very much once thank more. Thank you for having for us. For a fascinating segment. Zeus, thank you very much for being a, a good guest. And he's looking at me, he wants to know if he's gonna get a chance to stand on my head. Actually, right now, my head is actually one of the best points for him. It's like one of the highest points here. So he's always looking like, I wonder if I can just go stand up there. And for me, it's like not an option. <laughs> so I'm holding on to him here for my dear head life, literally. Well, let's not keep you back any further. We have your arms starting to get a bit purple. Oh, yeah. You see, you see when it started trembling and shaking there, you know, right? In the interest of Ricardo's safety, ladies and gentlemen, that's it for AM Prime. Thank you very much for joining us this morning. And thank you very much to all my guests, including Ricardo and Zeus. Look at that. He's just keeping his eyes on you. And now he's looking at you. There we go. And that's, oh, that's the best way to end AM Prime. I'm Keaton Sean. We'll see you again very soon. Bye-bye.